So when, when should you do something about it? Uh, when the blood is restricted so much, you do something about the heart murmur? The murmur itself usually doesn't indicate the degree of stenosis. The more accurate means is an echocardiogram because then what we get is velocity across there and as, as things become more stenotic, the velocity goes up and we've also got images from an echocardiogram so we can see that it's, it's calcifying, it's not moving. So really the, the, the echo is what determines these days whether it's progressed to the point that you need to have it fixed. So if you're otherwise pretty healthy, you just kind of let that go, the heart murmur? A murmur alone, yes. Unless it's um, unless you have symptoms, murmur alone usually isn't an indication for uh, for intervention. That's correct. Aneurysms can they be genetic? Yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. Also, people who have aneurysms in one per place in the body typically have them in other places. So it's not just in the chest or the abdomen. You can get them in the popliteal arteries. You can get them in the splenic arteries or the uh, mesenteric arteries. It can happen in multiple places. Most people don't get aneurysms if they have normal uh, arteries. There has to be some abnormality. Now, it can just be high blood pressure and genetics over time that's got a subtle abnormality. But if you form an aneurysm in one place, we look everywhere else to make sure you don't have others. So a malfunctioning heart would be uh, also um, depicted by maybe low blood pressure? It can be, yes. Okay. So if someone's developed heart failure to the point that the heart's not pumping as strong as it was, that's a common reason to have a low blood pressure too. Or in the aortic, in the case of the aortic valve, if the valve really isn't functioning properly and the blood's not being ejected properly, you can have low blood pressure from that as well. Um, but low blood pressure is genetic also? Yeah, some people have a normal blood pressure of 80. And that's their, that's their normal. Okay. Um, other people have a normal blood pressure of 160 and 80 for them would be very hypotensive. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. This is an Edwards valve. It's a different company. And this is a valve that's uh, mounted on a stent that's also a transcutaneous valve. Yeah, it's a pretty valve. <laughs> One of the downsides of this is putting it in transfemorally the way we do the, the arch is if there's a lot of calcium in the aortic arch too, we've got to go past all that stuff and that can increase the stroke risk. We have to negotiate the aortic arch. But the benefits is we don't use the heart lung machine. Now that's potentially a benefit. The downside is if the heart poops out in the middle of the procedure, then you don't have the, the help of the heart lung machine there too. So when I was talking about this off pump or beating heart surgery that we do all the time, we always have the heart lung machine standing two feet away from the patient. So if the heart gets irritable and isn't working fine, we put it right on the heart lung machine. Um, when, you're, when you've got these cannulas and things going up the aorta here, uh, it's not that easy to put the person on the heart lung machine right away. How does the heart start working after you've turned it off for four hours? So we clamp the aorta and we inject potassium into the heart to stop it. Potassium relaxes the heart and then it, and it stops. When we take the cross clamp off, the blood flow returns to the heart and washes that potassium out and the heart normally starts on its own. Sometimes it'll fibrillate and we need to shock the heart just to get it going again. But just allowing that potassium to flush out and blood flow to go through there normally starts the heart again. And we also let it warm up too because when we're doing the operation we put ice on the heart to, to decrease the uh, amount of blood, uh, the amount of oxygen required. And when it's warmer it doesn't require as much. I've heard you're having problems with heparin now. How's heparin been? Has it been improved? Have they found a problem with it? There were a couple of, uh, we, we didn't have a shortage here. Some hospitals did have a shortage of heparin. Um, a shortage? I'm talking about a reaction from, from heparin. <clears throat> I, what, I, I'm not familiar with that. Um, maybe called an allergic reaction to it, uh, not knowing it. Yeah, so some people can have a reaction to heparin. There hasn't been a widespread problem with that at all. Heparin is still the, the anticoagulant that we use drug. routinely. Yeah, there's a couple alternatives to people who have real allergies to heparin, mm -hmm. but there haven't been any, any widespread problems with it. There was a big shortage of heparin in some hospitals about six months ago. Yeah. I think one of the, um, it's interesting, uh, 
the, another drug, Lasix, which is used very commonly, diuretic, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's one factory in the country that makes the majority of injectable Lasix that burned down two weeks ago. So there's a shortage of Lasix in the country right now. There was a shortage of heparin about six months ago for the same reason. There were one or two manufacturing plants that had problems. That, the heparin problem's gone now. Okay, so the heparin problem. Okay. I'm talking about three years ago when it was, they were having a lot of severe reactions to it on the, on the operating table. We didn't have any of that here. So there, there may have been some uh, vendors or problems that had that, but we, we didn't have that problem here at all. Okay. Um, I have a video here of the transcutaneous valve. This is another vendor's video. This is the Edwards valve. There are two, two different companies. But it's similar to the other one. It shows you the, the this is called the sapient transcatheter valve that goes up through the femoral artery. Um, but it's, it's got good, good pictures. That's that atrial appendage I was talking about there where you put your finger in to fix the ventral valve. And that's typically what an ugly aortic stenosis valve looks like. All full of calcium and just not moving. So the first step is to put a wire up and put, put a balloon across this. And this again is something that we are doing now in some patients who have very bad stenosis and are not candidates for surgery. So we'll put a wire across the valve and then push a balloon up over the wire. Now is this referred to as uh relatively non-invasive surgery. Um, well, this is done, we do this in a cardiac catheterization laboratory with yes. the cardiologist. That's right, this is not in the open heart room. We don't need to do this okay. in the operating room because it's just down through the, through the artery there. So that valve was stretched out and then this is, I mean, the uh, native valve was stretched out and then this is the new valve that's being delivered over the wire here. When it's time to either blow up the valve or blow up the balloon in there, you'll see the heart fibrillates. We put a pacing wire in and we pace the heart at about 300 times a second so it's kind of fibrillating. Because what we don't want is the heart ejecting right as we're putting the balloon in there because it'll get blown out of the way where the valve will get misplaced. So that's what it looks like. Approximately how long would a procedure like that take? Um, about two hours. Yeah. <coughs> Valvuloplasties, that we've, done, we've probably done Maybe 10 now. Um, usually about 30 minutes. <coughs> and that's what this, this valve looks like when it's deployed. So then is that a uh, pressure fit? Or how, how is Theoretically, that? yes. It's supposed to, so you measure the size by ultrasound and you estimate what the size is by ultrasound. That's in contradistinction to what we do in the operating room. We cut the valve out and we have a little sizer that's the exact same size as the valves on the shelf and we can measure it. So the measurement of this is not quite as precise as we do in the operating room. There's one other method that's being developed now as well called transapical incision of this. So for people who have a terrible valve and can't have a heart operation for other reasons, we can make an incision in the chest over the apex of the heart and then stick a wire through there and um, do it that way. And so in people who have a lot of calcium in their aortic arch or down in their abdomen. This is the trans apical approach, uh, which can be done as well. So same, same ugly aortic valve, you'll see the same thing here. These are the coronary arteries that feed the heart over here. So at the base of the heart over here, is where the wire is going to be inserted. So they don't show the picture here, but you make an incision over the apex of the heart. Same place we put a mechanical heart in, if we're going to put one in. Put a wire through that, and then we, then we put the balloon up through there. That's the mitral valve, one thing there. <coughs> so we pace the heart very rapidly, balloon the valve to allow the the new valve to fit in this place. And then uh, that's on a balloon, it's on a stent and on a balloon and inflate in this place. This Edward system is in, currently in clinical trial now. We expect this to be approved probably within the next year or so. And we'll be 
getting it here once once it is true, once it's approved. How large a hole does it leave in the apex of the earth? Um, it's a pretty big hole that we have to sew up. So it probably is big as your finger. It's a pretty big delivery system. Same thing with the artery down here. Mm -hmm. So we do need to expose the artery surgically in the operating room, um, as opposed to just putting the balloon in, which is much smaller. So these small series show promise, and uh, I, again, I expect this uh, FDA approval within the, the next year or two. But there are still questions about proper sizing and valve durability, as well as complication rate. So you think even once this is approved, it's still only going to be for a very select number of patients who uh, can't undergo standard operation. So in summary, uh, surgery for heart valve disease is safe and effective. The current techniques are very successful in relieving symptoms and prolonging life. And I, I do think there are changes on the horizon in valve surgery. And I think we're going to be doing fewer and fewer second and third time around operations now that these transcatheter <coughs> valves are coming. That's something else I didn't mention. Somebody who's got a pig valve and it becomes calcified over time. To replace that, these days, most of the time we have to do a re-operation or second time around operation. Heart surgery the first time around these days is pretty safe. Second time around, not so safe. Uh, we do a lot of them and the vast majority of patients do well, but the risk of that is a lot higher than the first time around. That's because there's scar tissue there. And so um, we have to very carefully get back in again, take the wires out, cut the heart out, get all the scar tissue out. The, these valves may be able to be treated with a transcatheter valve over time. Is there any information on at this time if you've actually had a valve replacement and then a secondary is required that they can go in and do it through a valve system? Yes, there are uh, no, numerous reports in the literature of this valve and valve. Okay. Exactly. Yep. And that's, that's the other application that we think we'll probably use it for here as well. I think that's all my slides. So thank you for your attention and wonderful questions.